From We Are Spectacular, this is a Spectacular Marketing Podcast. A podcast about everything brand, marketing, digital and social for the food and drink industry and beyond. Today I'm at the DMA, which is the Direct Marketing Association on Margaret Street in Fitzrovia in London. And I've been learning all about GDPR from the experts GDPR not only in terms of what it means for business, but also what it means for food, drink, restaurant and pub marketing and beyond. We really got schooled this week by an amazing gentleman by the name of John Mitchison. And John is the Director of Policy and Compliance at the DMA. And he certainly got lots of great advice, translatable case studies and some real practical tips on what we need to do as an industry to get with the programme in terms of GDPR. We thought it'd be a really good chance to pick John's brains in a podcast format and share all of his ideas, his guidance and some great case studies and answers to some wonderful questions that we had in the workshop with you all through the Spectacular Marketing Podcast. Without further ado, I'll introduce you to John and hopefully you'll find this podcast extremely useful now on the 25th of May and into the future. It gives me great, great pleasure today um, to be sitting with the knowledge font of <laughs> uh, of everything GDPR. Oh, goodness. So a big hello to John Mitchison. Hello there. Hello. Um, thanks so much for coming down um, to have a chat today. We only met a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, and we were lucky enough uh, to have you run a session for us um, at the DMA, which is a direct market association for anyone that doesn't know, um, for all of our clients to really, and actually for us too, to be honest, <laughs> to find out about the world of GDPR and actually more specifically, you know, what it means for food, drink, uh, restaurant, pub operators. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've just had some great feedback on it. You know, everyone's been so chuffed. Okay, um, that's... With, with, with what you what you did. You okay, know, that's the, quite that's that's very pleasing. Oh, I'm, no, I'm glad they weren't, they weren't too frightened. Of. Oh no, it was so worth it. And again, I can give details of of how to go about that for your company later. Um, but you know, it's just a, such a worthwhile thing. We we've just our eyes are so open now Good. to what this is all about. Fantastic. So the other couple of things is, um, I was sort of wondering if John had any experience um, in podcasting, and it turns out he's a man of international mystery, <laughs> um, doing the the BBC World News. Yeah, that's night. right. Yes. So what, what happened? Yeah, no, uh, we had a last minute call into the office. And uh, BBC World wanted somebody to go in and talk about um, Facebook Ooh. and how their data had been used and the possibility of uh, new legislation changing the way Facebook do things. So I had Ooh. to go along and um, answer a few questions in front of the camera. <laughs> and were you as nervous as uh, Zuckerberg looked? <laughs> uh, well, I hope I didn't look as nervous as him. Uh, he looked like a frightened schoolboy. Yeah. Um, it, it's quite a weird experience, though, I have to say. Oh. You know, you get all hyped up, then you're in front of the camera for like 30 seconds, and then, well, yeah. you know, a couple of minutes or whatever it is, you walk away and you're all hyped up again. Yeah, adrenaline. Yeah, adrenaline. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we were just talking about this earlier, and, you know, there's someone's very cleverly edited together the highlights of the, the senators talking to, to Zuckerberg, and, oh, it's just, you know, hilarious that they're saying, so how do you make money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if you don't charge your users and you're like, that's why he's there. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy for us to forget. Um, that you know, people don't understand how marketing and, and mm. the internet works. You know, if they're if they're not into that kind of thing, I mean, yeah. some of those older senators, you know, they probably don't. They're on MySpace. Or yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Friends Reunited. Yes. Uh, one of these things. So yeah, so you know, really dragged you in today um, to you know suck your brains and rinse all of your knowledge um, <laughs> to just really help everyone out there in terms of you know GDPR. And I saw a really funny thing on a website the other day, which was. GDPR, WTF, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which it kind of sums it up in a rude way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be good to you know just kick off by really going macro and saying, what is it? <laughs> WTF. <laughs> yeah, WTF. Yeah. WTF. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
yeah, I mean, GDPR, people have probably heard lots of different things. Um, it, it can be a bit scary because there are articles out there that are literally trying to scare you um, about compliance and people are, you know, trying to make as much money out of it. There are all these so-called um, certified consultants that are offering to do uh, work for people. But basically, it, it shouldn't, it needn't be as frightening as as all that. I mean, you, you, you just need to sort of get your head around it, really. I mean, what, what we're dealing with is a change in data protection legislation. We've always had data protection legislation in the UK. Uh, the most, I say the most recent one, the most recent Data Protection Act came into force in 1998 and that served us very well. But soon after 98, obviously, we there was like a digital explosion. You know, we back in 98, there wasn't... Lastminute.com? There wasn't lastminute.com. Yeah. There wasn't um, uh, Facebook or, or any of the other sort of social yeah. media stuff going on. Digital was, was very new indeed. So... The Data Protection Act coped as well as it could with that kind of thing, but as the expansion and use of personal data has moved on, it's only right that the legislation should move on as well. So GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is an evolution of the existing data protection standards, um, and it's kind of built in a way to future-proof data protection so it should cope with any changes that come down the track there aren't i mean it's not as drastic as people think uh if if people were fully compliant with the existing legislation then coming up to the standard of gdpr mm. and those requirements isn't such a huge yeah. task to be honest well, with it's you. it's funny you know we well we're acting all smug now because we've been through your course you know <laughs> <laughs> like we know everything um but i was sitting with suzanne who's our, our head of digital and suzanne was the creative director at, at lastminute.com okay and i remember when we you know worked with the newsletter team and all that mm -hmm. we were doing the right thing then you know which yeah. was we had it all split out what you were signing up to which mm -hmm. you come on to um and i felt i think it's you know if you've always done the right thing and your moral compass has sort of been in the right place then you're probably well placed to be Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I think that's a very good point about the moral compass. I mean, um, a lot of the work that I do is part of a group at the DMA called the Responsible Marketing Committee, mm. and that's what it's all about, really. Um, the DMA isn't there just to sort of like act as a trade union um, and defend the, the the rights of people to do marketing at any cost. We want to promote responsible marketing, right? Mm. And when we talk about marketing and we talk about data, we're talking about um, communicating with individuals and those people, they could be anybody, couldn't they? It could be you. We're, we're all consumers as well as marketers, mm. right? So there's a guy that I know, he always talks in terms of his mum. So if anybody's talking about how they would use data, he'd say, how, how would my mum feel about mm. uh, you handling data in that way? And that's sort of like a good acid test. Because, yep. uh, you know, you want to be able to develop um, a decent relationship with your customers and prospects. Uh, you don't want to be taking advantage of them. No, it depends what his mum's like, I guess. If she's, well, quite, yes. if she's quite lassie fair, or, or, you know, <laughs> then, 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 then it's fine. Um, so, yeah, so I guess, you know, coming back to it, you know, why did this come in? Uh we're, we're governed by the, the EU. Mm -hmm. So within the EU, they, they saw that the existing uh, data protection legislation wasn't really covering all the, all the right things. And, um, it, it, you know, the use of digital had expanded to such an extent that uh, the, the data protection acts uh, in various countries around Europe weren't really appropriate. So they decided to create a, a data protection regulation, which mm -hmm. means that it will be implemented the same in every uh, EU country, mm -hmm. so it will harmonise data protection across the EU, and it will bring it all up to uh, a sensible standard. Um, it the, the the purpose of the legislation really is to put data back in the hand it's back in the hands back in the control of the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, a lot of people have thought that they've lost control of their data. Um, companies have kind of considered data to be their own. You know, this is our data. We will do what we want with it. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas now you have to think of it through the eyes of the consumer. There's a big cultural shift going on. Um, so it's the consumer's data. You can use it for as long as possible. You have to consider privacy at the outset of any project, um, the impact that it's going to have on somebody's personal information, um, and try and make sure that everything is upfront, transparent, and clear so that nobody's, nobody's surprised by anything that goes on with their data. Yep. So, you know... Uh, the way that my mind works, I'm very either pictorial or I need someone to 
tell me stuff. Okay. So I was listening to uh, one of the BBC podcasts, one of the money programs, mm -hmm. very good podcast on GDPR as well. And there was a guy from the IOC okay. was on there. And, and it was all good, but it was very lean back. And it was all the stuff's on our website, you go and get it. Okay. And, and I think what was great about meeting you and, and, and working with you in the last few days was it brought it to life and someone could just go through all of it and then say, do you know what? Here's the download. Here's the 101. This is yeah. kind of what, this is a highlight. This is what you really need to look at. And, you know, and on that program, I heard someone from a small business and they were a CEO. They had taken six months out of their business yeah. to try and get ready for it. And <laughs> most people listening can't imagine a senior player being out doing that. Yeah. You know? So it's really tricky, you know. It, it, it is tricky. A lot of the guidance that I've seen, you know, when I try and look into different um, subjects, you know, you, you try and find some guidance on how to handle a particular data um, problem. And what you find is that there are people, they just they just restate the law. The law, has, the law has been written. The law has been in place um, since 2015. So it, it is the law now. Um, it's 99 articles of sort of, impenetrable legal text Ooh. and then you try and find guidance it's a bit from... jay-z isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> 99 problems yes exactly. <laughs> um uh and they, they just restate the law you know they oh. just summarize it or put you know put it into bullet points rather than yeah. <laughs> then it's just the same thing what we try and do at the dma is we try and um turn this into sort of practical advice so um you know it's very you know the law very clearly tells you what consent is defined as mm -hmm. so i like to show people good examples and bad examples of mm -hmm. consent um and try and help them determine where they can draw the line you know in their business so, so yeah so i mean well, thinking about that then you know let's let's get into it so you know you started off with a great summary of kind of highlights yeah um which would be really neat to go through okay. and then maybe get into a bit more detail and there's some fun case studies you've got yeah, yeah okay all right so um as I said, the, the I mean, the full text is 99 articles uh, and it's pretty heavyweight legal stuff. And that's because GDPR talks about um, personal data, okay? It doesn't care what business you're in. It doesn't care if you're communicating business to business or business to consumer. It doesn't talk about different channels. It doesn't, it doesn't care whether you're making phone calls or sending emails. If you're doing medical research or if you're, you know, dealing with um, CVs in a, in a recruitment agency, it's all personal data. So as marketers and people sort of like communicating with customers and prospects about campaigns and you know offers and things like that i've kind of um trimmed it down to to to, to the points that are that are relevant to to our section of the of the of the industry so uh, at the top of the list something that the ico now the ico is the information commissioner's office they're the data protection authority in the uk they enforce this legislation so they're in they're kind of in charge of it now the ico talk a lot about accountability um now we have, we have some guidance. We've got a guidance document which has been um, reviewed by the ICO on the subject of accountability, and it's a good place to start. Basically, accountability, the principle of accountability, says that it's not enough to just comply with the legislation. You have to be able to demonstrate that you comply. So if anybody came to you and said, you know, why are you processing my data in this way or why did I receive this particular offer or whatever, you don't have to suddenly launch um, a big internal company investigation. Um, you can literally open documents and say well you know you you know you find the person you you signed up here so that means you're getting you know this is how we deal with data yeah. uh, and you get this kind of promotion and it would all be there and you would be able to I mean, the analogy really is you could be able to walk into a court of law and point at the various pieces of documentation and say that's why this is happening we've made these decisions we decided to do it this way and that's what accountability is all about it's about putting in place um, technical and organizational measures, keeping documentation up to date, training your staff, um, doing data protection impact assessments. So if, you're, if you suddenly decide to implement a new piece of software, take on a new supplier that's like handling personal data for you and make any big changes, you just there are sort of templates for running through a little impact assessment on the data protection that would highlight any areas of concern and then you could think about ways to mitigate those. You could You would then document that impact assessment and then you you could be confident that you're doing things in the right way yeah. uh, and it would stand up to any scrutiny mm -hmm. 
So that's uh, that's accountability, and I, I do labour that point because it is it is important to you know to have that background to uh, to to look into. But other things that come out of uh, GDPR, there is a, an expanded definition of personal data. So if you're as old as me, right, personal data used to be <laughs> used to be like a name and address, right? That's all it was. Um, and then of course telephone numbers and email addresses. But now it's it's, it's um, it now includes um, uh, online identifiers, so social media handles, IP addresses, um, location data, all of the other bits and bobs that might be collected um, on, on a digital journey. Each one of those on their own might not constitute personal data, so just just a piece of location data, data might not necessarily identify an individual, but once you link that with a device ID or an IP address or something else, then it becomes personal data. So that's quite important for people who do a lot of digital marketing. Well, I think what's going to be interesting is, like, you know, is someone going to complain if you tag them on something or you message them when you maybe shouldn't have and you know there's going to be all these things are going to crop up and and also the iBeacon sort of world where you're reading people's IP addresses when you don't really even know (laughs) and that kind of funky stuff there's going to be some big questions there right? Yes Uh, and it all comes down to what people are told there must be a point at which um, they either agree to have their data mm-hmm. um, accessed mm-hmm. um, or for their data to be transferred. And at that point of agreement, um, there has to be information available to people mm. to let them know that that's going to go on. So just to go slightly down a rabbit hole just on that one, though, because sure. it really blew my mind and the whole room sat up when you said about social media handles that everyone was like, oh, my God. You know, so let's say our um, following, um, what would we say? I'm following a burger bar burger mm-hmm. chain yep. and um you know I, when i'm going through that you know I, i'm getting i'm seeing their feed and all that but then they hit me up on like a dm mm-hmm. is it within let's say twitter's yeah thing or does that so, need to go in your privacy policy or <laughs> you know you're you're kind of in a um in a sort of a self-contained world within twitter so people that sign up to twitter they will uh, sign up to Twitter's privacy policy, which explains the kind of things that might go on with their data. Mm. So, as part of signing up with Twitter, you you know people are going to follow you, yeah. right? They're going to they, yeah. they're going to answer your tweets, things like that. That's kind of why you do it, and that's within that within that realm. So, if somebody direct message you um, with a promotion, th- with a promotion, that would be part of what you might expect from that. And then, but if so, the person might ignore that. Mm. And that's fine. You know, they can ignore it. And then if you, obviously if you just start sending them something like that every day, they mm. might block you or whatever. Mm. Right? But if they clicked on the link and went through to take up the offer, then they're in sort of like a different realm there. They're now on your website or your landing page or whatever. And they and if they needed to put in additional information to enter a competition or, or take advantage of that offer, mm. then there would be a privacy policy on that website which explained how that data would be used. Mm. So at each step of the way... You know, people are have access to information on how their data is going to be yeah. used. But then there's other interesting stuff, which is Facebook related predominantly, that you go on to, and not to go to the whole Facebook, <laughs> there'll be four of us, but, um, you know, you go on to, I don't know, um, Upper Crust website or whatever, mm-hmm. I don't know, and then you look at your Facebook a few minutes later mm-hmm. and it's serving you an ad. Yeah. Because, so that's all going <clears> to <throat> be quite. Yeah. And, What's happening there is you go onto the you go onto the website and then and there will be a cookie policy. Yes. Um, now at the moment, you don't need to do much about cookies. A little banner comes up saying we use cookies. You know, usually something pun related to chocolate chip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, and then you you know you click to say yeah, yeah. it's okay or whatever, or you don't. Um, now obviously, if you if you do click to say yes, it's okay, then a cookie will be put there, and it's that cookie that sort of tracks you and Ooh. places those ads. So again. If you wanted to, you, there would you could look at that cookie policy and understand exactly what's happening. Yeah. Um, people tend not to do that. No, I find say, I okay, got it, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the information is there if they want to. Um, now, cookies are covered by a slightly different piece of legislation. Um, it's the e privacy legislation, which um, in the UK is known as PECA or the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. Mm-hmm. 
don't like getting too technical, but there you go. That's <laughs> why we, we just, yeah, that's why we just yeah. stick to call it PECA. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds better. Uh, and that legislation is also undergoing review. So there might be changes about the way that cookies are handled in the future, mm-hmm. um, but at the moment that will just that will stay the same. Cool. So um, the next sort of topics that uh, cause a lot of debate, actually, and these are probably the most most serious topics um, from GDPR that affect marketers, are those of consent and legitimate interest. Right. So you gather consent to process people's data, mm. um, but you don't have to gather consent. Y- you can use your legitimate interest. Right. Every business has a legitimate interest to. Uh, process data to send marketing to uh, customers or prospects mm. right consent is very easy to understand because um, people see it in the form of a tick box you know you consent you tick a box you have to make a positive action now um, pre-tick boxes or silence on a telephone call uh, will not stand up as consent the person has to make a positive statement um, and so that's clear to for everybody generally to understand understand that concept but it doesn't have to be that way if you're particularly if you're um communicating um with uh, direct mail or through or by telephone you can exercise your legitimate interest you just tell people um, we would like to market to you uh, through the post if you would rather this didn't happen um, tick this box to opt out so you can still have an opt out option mm. um, now that works best with mail and telephone there are there's always sort of like the uh, exceptions there are certain exceptions um, with um, SMS and email as well even though those are electronic channels and generally because of the additional requirements added by the PECA regulations, um, they generally require consent. There, are, there is an exception for existing customers yeah. where you can continue to communicate with those people on an opt-out basis. Mm. But that's, and this, this is why it gets a little bit complicated, yeah. right? So again, there is guidance available on this uh, on the DMA website. Where within about the next two or three days we will have a guidance document on consent and legitimate interest a lot of people separate these two things as two separate topics um but we kind of put them together because i think it's important to talk to talk about them in the same it's it's about gathering marketing permission right so So it could be one or the other and and just to clear that up for for my simple mind then so you've got (laughs) um people that have legitimately actually, (laughs) but have opted in so that's Great data, everything's safe there, happy days. If you've ticked the box to say I want to get marketing yeah. from the company. Yeah. And I know you'll come into another bit in a sec. So there's that. With legitimate interest, mm-hmm. it's someone that's either sort of bought from you or shown interest in you. That's usually the best way um to justify it you have to show that you have a legitimate interest direct marketing is a legitimate interest and then you have to um go through a little legitimate interest assessment to quantify uh that you that your legitimate interest doesn't infringe on the person's um privacy rights Ooh. so it's like a little balancing test uh, obviously if they're a customer that is uh that's a very good way of being able to do that so yeah. you could uh, you know, just have an opt out, and it works very. Like I said, it works best for mail uh, and telephone contact because mm-hmm. there's no additional legislation um, on top of mm-hmm. that because it's not electronic. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, I mean, a little bit more on consent. Not, um, consent has to be as well as just a tick box. Uh, it has to be freely given. Okay, so it has to be a genuine choice. And we talked about this earlier in the that week. That was controversial. Okay. So I, this is why I just wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's mind was blowing yeah. at that point. <laughs> you, undoubtedly... So, okay, so consent. Freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. Okay, so it has to be a choice. You have to be specific about what people are signing up for. Um, they have to have information about what they're signing up for so they know what's going to happen. It has to be unambiguous, meaning they can't do it by accident, right? So no pre-tick boxes or anything like that. It has to be unbundled. So it can't be as a condition of another service. It can't be, um, you know, by signing up to, a, you know, by buying our products, you also agree to marketing. You can't do that kind of thing. 
it has to be granular so you have to sort of break it down if you're doing a lot of different things uh, with the data or you've got a huge range of products you know like uh, hotels restaurants mm -hmm. car mm -hmm. rental whatever it might be you might need a separate tick box for each one of those um, it has to be named so you have to if you're sharing data with third parties who are also going to name uh, who are also going to market to those people you have to name the third parties that that data is going to uh, you have to document it so that people know when they sign they're able to find out when they signed up and you know through what form or page or whatever and it has to be easy to withdraw uh, and that's that's not too difficult that's normally an unsubscribe link or something like that but when it comes to the freely given the, the discussion that we were having earlier in the week was about incentivizing an opt-in mm -hmm. so a lot of people might say uh, put your email address in this box to receive our regular newsletter mm -hmm. um, and get five pound off your next bill yep. or get a free something mm, and it, yeah <laughs> and it, it might be uh, that people don't see that as freely given um, in that you're sort of incentivizing it or you're kind of bribing the the opt-in there was an example that uh, we put on the screen um, from a clothing manufacturer which said um, we put your email address in here and we will send you special offers information on new collections uh, sale items things like that mm -hmm. um, and that's it was white stuff, was it? It was, some it like was. white stuff. It yeah. was, yeah, it was the white stuff. You may want to check that. It was a, it was yeah. a good example. Yeah, it, was, it, was a, it was a nice, clear example of, you know, obvious privacy policy, all that kind of thing, very straightforward. Um, and then we started talking, I mean, it is a little bit like semantics, really, isn't it? Because you know that if you sign up to that, you know, you're going to get information that other people aren't going to get, and that mm -hmm. might be considered some sort of incentive. Mm -hmm. But to literally say to somebody, you know, do this and we'll give you a fiver, um, that might not be considered freely given. Yeah. So you just, I think you just have to think about that a little bit. Well, if, I think one of the biggest points was, and this is why there was fear rippling through the room, <laughs> is that it's kind of how food and drink have always done it. You know, sign up and get a free beer. And, you know, hotels do the same thing. You know, get your first drink at the bar. Yeah. Um, also, you know, a free starter, a free dessert. Mm -hmm. or And... Yeah, I think that's that particular one is a is a shockwave because people are going to have to think better, you know, less yep. transactional about how they persuade someone to sign up for an email. Yeah, no, I think you're right, and I and I don't want I don't want to come down too hard on this and get too sort of like um, you know Ooh. police state or anything. I'm just, I'm just telling you the rules, yeah. and in and in some. In some cases, it's very obvious that the incent is not freely given because people are being, you know, bribed too much, and you know, and somebody might take issue with that. But I'm kind of into it, right, for two reasons, and I'm, I'm really excited about it actually because one is it's reasonably lazy. To be <laughs> fair, you're probably going to get some crap data. Well, Do you know, yes, you're going to get someone that's out for a freebie, and you've all seen the people that are signing up with twenty emails to get twenty four pints, <laughs> and you know, getting with moustaches on and different oh. hats, and you know, and then and then the other thing I would I would sort of see on it as well is that it's about the strength of your brand, yeah, and that's why white stuff will win because it's got a super strong brand. It, it comes back to the the cultural shift um, about GDPR. It's all about the customer informing the customer being honest and transparent i mean you could just walk down the street and ask people for email addresses and you'll get email addresses you know if you're giving away a pint um but of what value is that data to you later there is a certain it sort makes of quality you feel good in the board yeah room. pretty <laughs> yes, much right, it's okay. a numbers game you know it's all about braggability yeah i've got four million i've got five million you oh, know and, yeah. and, and that's the way but i'm glad I'm, I'm actually glad because the metric really always should be engagement it should be engagement it should be you know it's, it's quality of data it's you know so if you you know built a database based on you know get a free point um what you know you you then email that database the next week and what kind of engagement are you going to get you know you're probably going to get the same engagement as if you weren't giving away free point and it was just people just genuinely signing up because they want to know um about your brand and, and something we talked about as well was uh, it's a bit of a watershed moment but actually in a really positive way because for all the marketers out there that have just wanted to clean up their database oh yeah man you've never had a better excuse yeah to, to, to just get it down to basic or completely 
bin it and start again. You know, you've got this, you've got the power in your hands to actually do something brilliant. The, the example that we used, which sort of highlighted this, and it, and it is exactly this, it's the free I did, beer. I did sign up for this. You did? I did. <laughs> did you? Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> I'm a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, uh, it's quite possible that people have seen this Brewdog One Million Beers on Us ad that's been going around. I know in London they uh, they had it on the front of like the free magazine that they give away on the tube. Um, so I went to the website to see what it was all about. And uh, they just ask for some basic details. They just want your name and your email address. And then there's a couple of boxes to tick uh, to be able to get your free beer. Uh, and one is that you're over 18, which is perfectly reasonable. And then the next box is, um, you know, you agree to marketing. I didn't want to agree to the marketing, but I still wanted the free beer. And I can't have it. Right. Oh. So I have to agree to the marketing in order to get the beer. Right. So that's sort of that would be described as bundling the consent, right? Because it's a condition of the service. Um, and after 25th of May, the, yeah. the, this, the, how legit is that data? Um, well, I, you know, and uh, somebody from BrewDog may well challenge me on this. Okay, yeah, <laughs> So, so uh, you know, I use these examples yeah. because they're real examples. Yeah. Um, and for me, I couldn't justify this because it's not... Um, it you know the the consent is a condition of of what's going on, and in my eyes, the, then that data couldn't reasonably be used after the twenty fifth of May. It really doesn't come up to the standard of GDPR consent. Now, saying this, um, if they do use that data, you know what's going to happen, mm. right? Well, the ICO in the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, they're the people that enforce the legislation. They are a very pragmatic regulator. Uh, they're, they're not, you know, they're not like, uh, you know, like the old fashioned secret police or anything yeah, yeah. like that. They don't come around sneaking and looking at things, yeah. you know, without you knowing. They work on the basis of complaints, right? So if your marketing or your use of data generates complaints, then they will come and ask you questions about it. They don't walk in and start throwing fines around on day one. They want to know why you're doing it, you know, what was your thinking behind the process, you know, um, why do you think it's reasonable to do this? So, um, and it might be that they just ask you to stop doing it, you know, mm -hmm. well, we see you're doing that, we don't think it's right, and here's why, yep. um, just don't do that anymore. Um, and obviously, if you refuse to do that, or you were doing something that was blatantly against the rules just because of your own negligence they might start talking about fines yeah. and that kind of thing but um yeah they don't tend to do that kind of thing i would have so, given away so much more to get a free <laughs> 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 my yeah. wife my yeah. family <laughs> uh, you know um so a lot of a lot of the, you know the gdpr is not a prescriptive piece of legislation it doesn't say you must do it exactly mm. like this and this is exactly where the line is drawn it's uh it's a, um, a principles-based piece of legislation so it's it often comes, and everybody's marketing is different, so it often comes down to people, you know, making a decision based on what they know about their customers and how they're going to react and uh, and how far they think, um, you know. One of the good examples is about whether something is um, an information message or a marketing message, right? Yeah. So if you want to send marketing... There are obviously rules about sending marketing, but an information message is different. You know, you have to send information, right? You know, here's an order confirmation. You've ordered. We've received your order, right? People would be surprised if they didn't get that, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but if you suddenly start putting a lot of marketing into your order confirmation and somebody hasn't agreed to marketing, Ooh. then there comes a limit at which, you know, it's no longer a information message. It's also a marketing message and you have to sort you know but where you draw that line is up to every company to make that distinction i think back in the day lastminute.com's confirmation email was about four pages was it really <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Lots of yeah. marketing stuff. well you know and that's what that's what we mean you know things have moved on people yeah. um you know your customers might not find that acceptable anymore you know yeah. and you will have a much more structured approach to that so uh, confirmations are literally yeah. that Here's your confirmation, and there might just be a link at the bottom. You know, if you want to find out more, Ooh. go to our website or yeah. you know, other stuff. Um, that wouldn't have been acceptable to the commercial team back then. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd have got hold over look, the calls. I, for that. I, I know. I mean, some <laughs> some of the things that I've done in the past, um, you know, really wouldn't pass the test either mm. these days. But uh, you we know, won't look over we're, we're 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 not there, are we? Um, 
again, looking at the subject of consent, one of the other um, examples, and again, you know, I picked this example out because I'm questioning it, you know, I'm sure um, uh, there would be other people out there that would be able to defend it, but, you know, it is questionable, and, you know, and this is why you have to go through the process of sort of documenting it and justifying it for yourself, really. So this one um, is quite a good one, uh, and in a way I don't... Anyway, let's just say I'm sorry if there's any Man United supporters out there. Okay, I'm so one, I'm one over you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, <God. laughs> well, I think what's so interesting about them? They've made such a noise about it. They have made you know? a lot of noise about signing up um, to opt into their messages. But when you go to their website, you you don't just opt into messages from Man United. You're also opting into messages um, from their sponsors as well. Um, now. It's possible that you can change that elsewhere in the privacy mm-hmm. policy. Uh, so, uh, they they have a preference centre, yeah. um, but that preference centre was was quite confusing um, and not very obvious how to how to deal with things. But certainly on the on the front page where you go and put your information in, you know you you were clearly agreeing uh, to receive, um, you know both sponsor information and man united information and that should have been separated out you know because there's a lot of people that do want to hear about upcoming games and mm. you know stuff going on with man united but they don't want to be bothered by man united sponsors right well just on that point then because I'm, I'm again i'm thinking back to more of my data days at, at lastminute.com and stuff and when so let's say we were selling some of the information we had um like you're, so you're saying at the point of sign up, let's say it's mm-hmm. my news, so the point of yep. sign up, um, and it was tick boxed out, so I'm going right, DHL, Aeroflot, da 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 da, you know, all the other ones, yeah, Chevrolet, whatever. Mm-hmm. What if in six months' time <laughs> they then decided to sell that information to, I don't know, Ann Summers or whatever it is, <laughs> for, for whatever reason, then pff, you just can't. Yeah, you're right. So the. It's kind of like an agreement. So whatever you're told at the time you hand over your data. So let's say, you know, we'll leave Man United out of it, but, um, you know, let's say I sign up with a company and they say, well, you've, you know, you can sign up to hear from, um, from us about our products, but, you know, we have partners. So, you know, you might be a, a you know, a, a, um, a company offering flights and you might have partner hotels or partner car rental companies. Uh, and it'd be very easy to say, you know, as well as hearing from our hotel, hear from our partner hotels, this is a list of the hotels, tick, mm-hmm. tick, tick, right? And you could choose which ones you want to hear from. Um, yeah, and that's your that's your agreement. That's what you were told at the time. That's what you've literally agreed to because yeah, you've yeah. put a tick box there. If another partner comes along later on, you haven't ticked that box, yeah. right? So you can't you can't hear about that. Because, mm. you know, I'm just thinking about it from a selfish point of view. You know, you're... <laughs> A new marketing manager, marketing director, whatever, you come and you go, I've had this great, I, all that data's been sitting and actually, mm-hmm. you know, a commercial radio station would love that, you know, yeah. or whatever, a well, suntan cream company or whatever it, it is. It, it doesn't mean that your people will never get to hear about that. I mean, you, you, if you're communicating with people regularly, um, you know, you could, you might say, oh, you know, part of the communication might be, we've taken on a new sponsor, mm. right? Um if you'd like to hear from that sponsor, to hear. And then that could be added to their... Yeah, but then obviously you're relying on people actually doing it. Yeah, um, but that's, that's know, the whole thing, isn't I it? Know. You know? But I think, uh, like, uh, the greedy marketer in me um, <laughs> is is just very... Because, you know, and I think there's been some great companies I've done what Man you have done, you know, in, in, in the restaurant world and, and pub world at the moment. I've only seen a few right enough. And the things came through saying... Unless you re-sign back up, or you opt in now, mm-hmm. then you know you won't hear from us. Which yeah. I think is morally the right thing to do, th- potentially. Or, or it's it's, it's yeah. extreme. It's extreme. It, yeah, it is a bit extreme, and I don't think that people necessarily have to do that in every case. So there were early on, there were a few people that maybe jumped the gun and just sort of thought, "Oh God, we're going to have to get a new consent Start for again. all of our data." So you email everybody and say. Uh, you know, re-consent, otherwise we're, you're never going to hear from us again. Mm. Um, and they're probably not, they probably didn't get a massive uptake from that. No. And of course, people that people that didn't respond have effectively said no, right? So you've you you then limited, yeah. you've restricted your marketing database. There are other ways around that. You don't have to do it that way. Mm. Um, 
But I, th- I think that's a good point because I think a lot of people are thinking that. Well, if 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 you're communicating, if you're currently communicating with people using consent through the email route, which is you know the majority of you know what we were talking about, um, then if you've if you've been collecting that consent mm. to a high standard, yeah. you know it was a tick box. People were told about what was going on. Um, it wasn't anything hidden, uh, and that, and now you're able to go back and you know you could demonstrate that. So if one of those people asked you where they consented, you'd be able to tell them. So it's all nicely documented. If if you've got that kind of record, which anybody with a decent sort of CRM system yeah. would, um, you can continue using that consent. Yeah. That kind of comes up to the standard, and there's no reason you can't um, continue going down that yeah. track. I'd- I think, though, what's really interesting, I think you maybe got a sense of it when you were in the room the other day, is how tight the restaurant and pub industry is for marketing resource. Yep. Um, Very opsled. You don't usually have anyone that does data or anything like that, unless it's a big company. So if I was back at Yosushi right now, Man, would I be worried? Because I don't think I could go through back then. I mean, it's probably changed by now, but back then, because we were you know super under resourced, to go back and see that person saying up that way, that person saying up that way, and and yeah. So I think for a lot of people, the easiest thing was just to go. Do you know what? Let's wipe it. Well, did you, do you remember what happened with um, Weatherspoons? That was in the press. Yeah. They basically just decided to bin their entire database. I thought that didn't was they? quite clever. It was a, it was because, quite because a bold got, move because they got the PR. <laughs> they did, um, and they also um, looked like the good guys. Yeah, and they then quite cleverly then pushed everything to social media. Right. However, you could argue they've maybe lost some opportunities on that, but I think that first mover advantage of just stand. But I think initially people's head was a lot of trade and things and marketers their head wasn't in the GDPR game so they yep. were a bit like some dodgy and actually not at all I think you know it, it was a pretty smart move to just well, they, wipe I mean uh, I suspect that maybe they had a look at their data and I would have had I would have imagined that they had a pretty large mm. pool of email addresses oh, yeah. um, but with a very small engagement you know they've mm. collected that data over a long period of time through you know various kind of sign up message mechanisms um, and maybe they thought, well, you know, that we've got quite a big bunch of data here that really mm. doesn't do a great deal. Mm. So, uh, I, I, I'm sort of seeing them as brave. I really, I really yeah. thought it was yeah, yeah. bravery, but I thought the nice little bit of sass at the end of the message was, we're, we're on social. And again, it's something that, you know, we with us, they just surprise you every time, which is, you know, <laughs> you just go, wow, that, that you know, they're so forward thinking in so many ways and they right. don't get the credit for that it's no. really really bizarre no, they, they come across quite differently don't yeah, they? yeah it's yeah. quite amazing so yeah and another cu- well a couple of examples you, you gave us on the day as well was uh, and you, you may be coming to this uh-huh. but there was the, the Honda and Flybe yeah. ones were really interesting I know it's not food and drink but it's just quite interesting what they did yeah because they they tried to refresh uh, the consents that they had. So Flybe made a bit of a cock up. They um, they're an airline on the south coast. They had quite a large mm-hmm. database of people. Early on in the GDPR process, they they made that decision. They were just going to go out and um, try and refresh everybody. Mm-hmm. Now they took their entire database and emailed everybody and said, you know, the rules are changing. You know, you you're on our database. If you'd like to hear from us, click this button. Mm-hmm. Right. Now. They did that to everybody, even people that had previously opted out, right? So that was a big mistake on their part because, you know, people who opt out, who take the time to actually unsubscribe from emails, who then suddenly get another email asking about marketing, those people are going to get their... Service message? Yeah, yeah. it's (laughs) not a service message, no. If you're asking about marketing, it's a marketing message, right? But they also incentivized it. They also Mm. said anybody that does opt back in will be entered into a prize draw, right? So that doesn't really cover the freely given thing. So, mm. I mean, that was that was just wrong, right? They should have known better. Yeah. Uh, and that's why they got a fine. The ICO said, you can't break one law to try and comply with another, right? Uh, and, it make, and it makes perfect sense. Yep. Um, and Honda was Honda was similar. They, they emailed people where, the, 
admittedly they didn't know that these people had opted out but they had no marketing preferences on mm -hmm. them at all so they had no opt-in or opt-out they were just like you know completely blank yeah. um and so you know they they got a small fine as well for that yeah. uh yeah yeah so i mean you know, you, you you do have to be a bit careful, but yeah. you, obviously you can only email people that you've got permission to email. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't suddenly start emailing uh, uh, people that have given you no yeah. no information and try and get away with it. But I think my big worry for the for our wee wee big industry is, um, I, I I think a lot of the guys just won't know, and you know, there's a lot of turnover in the market world in our mm -hmm. sector and things like that as well, and. You you know you're inheriting the I don't want to say a sure. a, a bad football team but you know you're kind of you know inheriting <laughs> some database. sort of yeah a bad day, you know bad stuff all over the place okay. and yeah well I, what I would for the guys. what I would recommend um, the ICO have recently published um, a guidance document on legitimate interest and and it's it's not it's not a heavyweight read right it's yeah. not a doc, it's not a legal document so you can go to their website and download it and in there it talks about repermissioning so um let's say you know you might have a database data that you've collected recently you know you know everything about it it's rock solid okay we'll we'll keep that segment mm -hmm. we'll communicate with that under the rules of consent that's no problem but all this other data uh, under the previous marketing manager mm -hmm. or whatever it might be um i'm less confident of the standard of consent there i can't really make all the demonstrations so you've got this opportunity to not use consent but use legitimate interest so you would you might send out an email to all of those people once all of your other sort of uh privacy policies and things are up to date mm -hmm. and you'd say um you know we've been emailing you in the past um we'd like to continue emailing you um, we're going to be doing this under the rules of legitimate interest. Mm. Um, here's our new privacy policy that explains anything. These are the highlights of the changes, blah, 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 blah. If you don't want to continue hearing from us, unsubscribe here. Right? And obviously every email you send in the future will also have an unsubscribe on it. I mean, that's mm. sort of like, you know... In a clear place. Yeah, that's, that's common practice. Yeah. Everybody can unsubscribe. Um, but you're just laying it on the line for those people. Mm. The rules have changed. We've got your information... We're going to be using legitimate interest from now on for you. And then, so you've got two pools of data. One pool that you are that you know a lot about and you're continuing with consent and the other pool, legitimate interest. And you might take the view that, well, we'll, we'll treat that slightly differently. We'll try and get those people to engage again and um, get them to consent in other way, in other areas, through other forms and bring them up to the right standard. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, you might, sort of downgrade them again okay. if they're not engaging um until eventually they either disappear or some or you delete them or whatever well it's um, quite it's quite interesting on that point or very interesting in terms of you know customer life cycle programs and mm -hmm. again in the industry i don't see enough of that if i go dormant but again as long as it's been signed up in the right way you can definitely you know do three or four emails to take them down a, oh, a, yeah. a, a you know customer life cycle plan you know and yeah. I, I remember back at lastminute.com we uh talk a lot about the, the pink palace at the moment um <laughs> but uh but yeah last week um we had this series of emails right now, and it was maybe three or four and by the end it just was called it, it was titled uh barefaced bribery <laughs> and then it was just like here's a tenor buy something right, buy something or, or, that, or yeah. we're not gonna yeah, yeah, yeah we're not gonna that. communicate man anymore. the engagement on that one <laughs> Yeah. Watch Frey Big. Was it really? Yeah, oh, okay. Absolutely. It was your, the last chance saloon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, so I was just going to say, just recapping though, just because we've been going mm, oh, down yeah. a couple okay. of wee rabbit holes and stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to read upside down, like trying to get in a nightclub. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, so yeah. We, we, we've talked about accountability and, um, you know, personal data is now more than just a name and address. We've talked a little bit about consent and legitimate interest. Other areas that people will need to be aware of um, are... Uh, their privacy policy. Mm. Every every website, every organisation has to have a privacy policy, and there is now more information that's required in that privacy policy. It's not just a one size fits all, you know, um, information notice that uh, the, you know that anybody can use. You, you've got to make it very relevant to your own business, and there's more things that you have to describe. Um, privacy policies used to be there pretty much for the for the protection of the company now they are genuinely there to inform the consumer so a consumer would go there they would understand who you were um, how your data was going to be used if there was any marketing profiling going on what the um, 
what the consequences of that might be, all that information. And again, the ICO has a very good uh, guidance document mm -hmm. um, that you can download, which tells, talks you through everything that needs to be uh, included. So mm -hmm. you could take your privacy policy, work through it, and just add in the extra bits that you need mm -hmm. quite easily. Um, so, I mean, as far as information goes, the ICO does have good information on its website. There are several guidance documents um, that are that are very good. Uh, they tend to talk in general terms um, about um, about GDPR. So, you know, sometimes they might be giving examples that don't seem relevant, but you 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 know you can get the gist. Yeah. Uh, the DMA also has guidance uh, on a number of subjects, and it also has uh, lots of articles and and research on on GDPR where you can sort of get your head around it. Um, uh, but that's all very much targeted, obviously, at marketing, mm -hmm. um, and that may be much be, maybe much more relevant to you know the the people that we're talking to. Um, when I mentioned in privacy policies that you have to um, tell people what you're doing about profiling, you know, most marketers do some kind of profiling um, with their data, even if it's just segmenting the file into different regions or something like that. Um, it's another form of data processing, so you do have to have a legal ground for processing the data. Um, most of the profiling that marketers do isn't too sinister. Yeah. Uh, you're not getting turned down for a mortgage or a visa or whatever. So um, you can just you can you can more than likely justify it under the grounds of legitimate interest, mm -hmm. unless it starts getting too creepy um, when you're going out and finding out you know how many children somebody's got and what car they drive and the type of house they've got. You know mm -hmm. you're buying all kinds of different variables from, which is unlikely. You yeah. know. Um, in which case, you might need to have a, a special tick box for the kind of profiling that you're doing. But I think marketing generally uh, is uh, fairly fairly benign. Um, some of the things that have that have got people worried and certainly get a lot of discussion uh, on the web are the new rights. Okay, data mm -hmm. subjects or consumers have um, their rights have been strengthened under GDPR. They're called data subjects. People, yeah. In a royal sense? Like, like. <laughs> I'd never thought about it yeah, like that. You yeah, so uh, you are a data subject. <laughs> I, you are a, a piece of data yeah. that identifies you. So, yeah, personal data is just about identifying um, a living individual. If you're identifying, like, the, the contents of a postcode or a group of people, you know, over 50s that like wine, for example, that, that is, it's data, but it's not personal data because you're not identifying individuals mm -hmm. in that. Um, but when you're talking about individuals' rights, um, people have always had rights under the under the existing act. But there's a, there's a couple of extra ones uh, that have got people a bit nervous. So people might have heard about the right to be forgotten or the right to erasure. That's my favourite one <laughs> because it just makes me think about the band. Yeah, well, I used to say <laughs> that just, in my presentations, but most of the people I talk to don't remember who oh, erasure no, is these there's days. A few yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other day, yeah, I love erasure. Yeah, so. Um, it's it's not about the band. Oh, <laughs> um, it's about deleting your data. So you can technically you can phone any company and invoke your right to be forgotten or your right to erasure, whereby they would need to delete all their data. Now, it's not an absolute right, mm -hmm. so the company can challenge it. And of course, there is data that a company has to keep, right? So yeah. financial information, anything they need for legal reasons, um, and suppression would count as a as a valid reason as well. So if somebody is um, asking to be forgotten, you might want to keep just enough information on them to suppress them from any other marketing campaign so that you don't get in contact with them again. Yeah. Um, but really, this is one of the things in GDPR that I don't think... It, this, isn't, this isn't aimed at marketers. This is mm. probably aimed at other, other parts of the industry. But it is there, and it's just something to be, to, to, be, uh, to be aware of. And something we touched on, I think I asked the question in the session, was, was there a template or a form that could get people right because again i don't know if all the yeah. guys will have their house in order you know yeah I mean? so w th this, i think this is more relevant to subject access requests right, right? so uh, again anybody can contact any company and ask them to send them all the data that they have on them yes right um which and that's called a subject access request uh now in the past, you used to be able to charge 10 quid for a subject access request, and I think that probably put a lot of people off from asking right. too many of them. Um, but now it has to be free under under the new rules, uh, and, you, and you've got 30 days in which to supply that information. Now, 
you know, if somebody phones up and says, oh, my name's John, um, I want you to give me all the information on me, you have to be, you have to make yourself confident that that person really is who they say they are, That's right? True. So it wouldn't be unreasonable to have a form and a, and a sort of a little procedure mm. that people went through if they wanted a subject access request. So the first of all, they have to, you have to be confident that they are the person who they are mm. and they, they can give you some information and then you can go away and look in all of your systems extract all the information and then provide it back to them yeah uh and some companies are a little bit worried that uh if they annoy the general public they might suddenly it might be a seen as a as a sort of like a weapon against a company <laughs> you know you suddenly get a thousand yeah, thousand yeah. data subject access requests because uh, it is quite hard work for an organization it's rarely is that information all in one place you do have to you know dig around and, and get it out so it's something worth thinking about develop a policy for your business mm. in case that does happen but um i mean other than that most of the other um uh data data uh, data subject rights are much the same people need to be informed um you need to tell them what's going on about profiling um you know pretty so, much the same so just thinking of a couple of other things as well, what's at risk here? Um, and it's all getting sensationalist. Um, yep. the, the maximum fines are? <laughs> Millions. That's yeah. a lot, isn't it? Uh, 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover. Whichever's most. Whichever's most, yeah. So, yeah. which is a massive increase uh, on what it was before. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, I don't like to, I mean... It's one of the things that has, that has got GDPR uh, to the top of like you know people's yeah. attention, and I and I can't fault it for that. It's it's right that people know about it, but I don't really want to dwell on the fines because, as we've said, the ICO in the UK, they don't really like issuing fines. It's kind of like um, it's their last resort. Mm. They would much rather um, just get people to do things better, work with you to Edu get it right, yeah, to educate. Yeah. 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 And, uh, so uh, if you, if you've made an honest mistake. And, you know, and like we said, you know, you've, you can show that you've thought about it and you mm. did a campaign or something, but, you know, you got a few complaints and the ICO come and look and say, well, we can see why you thought that was okay, yeah. but we think you're wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't do it again. Yeah, yeah. Right? You, it might be something as simple as that. And you'll get a notice on the, on the website and you'll be told that you've had your wrist slapped, but you're not going to get millions of pounds yeah. of fines. It's almost well, the like fine, the ESE in a way. Yeah, that, 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 and, it, and if fines are issued... They, they have to be proportionate, right? Mm. So it's not like, you know, the little corner pub is going to get a million pound fine. Mm. One, of the, one of the things that the ICO have as their rules for issuing fines is the company has to afford, be able to afford to pay it. Mm -hmm. There's no point, you know, there's no point in them giving, you know, a one-man band a 10 yeah. million pound fine because it's, you know, yeah. there's no it's good just, to anybody, no, is it? not going to help. So they have it? to afford to pay, be able to afford to pay it. Um, and then in terms of the highlights... What else have we got? Yeah, that's that's pretty much the end of my list. The that's only right. other thing to concern yourself about is, uh, and this doesn't get a lot of mention, is is processors, data processors' responsibilities. So, if you have um, data processors that work for you, and by data processors I mean any sort of outsourcer that handles data for you, so it might be a mailing house, call center, uh, an, uh, an email service provider, mm. somebody that's somebody that you give data to that. D then does something with that data yeah. they they are on the hook for any problems that might occur with that data yeah. whereas in the past they could just say well you know we were just following instructions mm. you know it's nothing to do with us mm. um now they do bear some responsibility so if you're exchanging data with companies um for them to you know send stuff out on your behalf you might see them questioning your data yeah right so where did you get this data are you mm. sure we're okay to contact it email mm. it phone it whatever it might be um because they, they they need to be they need to satisfy themselves that they're yeah. not going to get into trouble so there might be a little bit of contract um rewriting going on there yeah mm. so there's a couple of questions that were worth kind of bringing out as well that kind of happened uh, on the day and i just think you know great questions and um there was uh, one uh, lady in the audience, Maria, who was just the best questions in the world. It was yeah. like being on QI, so it was just amazing. <laughs> you know, I was telling her that, you know, it's just, just your gold star on the day for, yeah. for that stuff. So um, one of them that came up was Wi-Fi login. Yes. So when people 
log into Wi-Fi, um, the, you're often asked for an email address, aren't you? Uh, and at that point, you sometimes have to agree to marketing. Mm -hmm. Well, that sort of goes back to some of the other examples that we had um, earlier on. I mean, you might there might be a reason that you need an email address to confirm somebody's identity, or you mm -hmm. know, just sort of like send a confirmation email. But that would be the extent of it. You would, the any marketing um, or other use of the data. So marketing, you would probably need a tick box mm -hmm. for the marketing. If the data was going to be used in any other way, there would need to be a privacy policy. Um, that somebody could go to mm -hmm. to understand how that data was going to be used mm -hmm. because I know that sometimes it's used for analytics where people are yep. and that kind of thing. Yep. So, um, yeah, people just need to know. I mean, if you had to summarize GDPR in just a couple of sentences, it really is, you know, you can't do anything with anybody's data that they don't know is going to happen. Yep. Um, they have to have been made aware of it mm -hmm. or at least have had access to the information that would tell them that yep. in the form of a privacy policy and you know um, it, everything should be within the reasonable expectations of of the data subject right? mm -hmm. the consumer the mm -hmm. customer whatever so um, if you think it's that anybody would think it was perfectly reasonable that that would happen with their data that's a good starting place as well yeah it's when you do things without anybody's knowledge or without telling them or you know yeah you'll end up in the Capitol <laughs> Hill, whatever. Um, yeah. And then another one that came up, and we don't actually know the firm answer to this, but it's worth talking about, and then we can yeah. maybe follow up. So the question came up about um, booking tables. Mm -hmm. So book a table, open table, resi, mm -hmm. whatever, res diary and all these. So what sent the room into absolute turmoil was this chat about marketing preferences yes so, so yeah so technically you're supposed to take somebody's last um their last preference mm. as their as their as their preference and in a way you, you can completely understand that right mm -hmm. um but if somebody has agreed to marketing when they've been on your website for example mm -hmm. and then they maybe book a table through open table or one of those others uh, they might be offered marketing at that point as well so mm -hmm. if they then don't then if they don't agree to marketing on the open table, when you get that data, that marketing preference will be your latest preference. And so they have then not agreed to marketing. Yeah. Um, and, and interestingly, the thing that, that brought this up or that most people were concerned about was, was their own sort of like directors and managers who want to see all the marketing, often book... Yeah, that's book right, yeah book using open table but never yeah. click yes to yeah. marketing because they think oh i've already said yes to marketing well, i think right? that's a consumer view too probably well, yeah. it, it, it may well be um but so 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 i was trying to think of ways that we could deal with this problem mm. because it and it, so because it might be something i think it's more more specific to to this kind of situation yeah because generally, if I was asked that question, I would just say, "Well, you take somebody's last preference, uh, and if they haven't, if they haven't agreed, well, they they haven't agreed, right? They, so you can no longer send them marketing. And people change their preferences all the time. I mean, if if, if you know, at each interaction, you mm. know, they might you know they might change their mind. Yeah. Um, you know, they might opt out. They might unsubscribe from an email yeah. and then opt back in somewhere else." So you do have to be a, a, a bit aware of this. I mean, you have if, to be if, quite agile, really. I mean, if it, if, it, if it went the other way, if somebody had opted in, but then when they were presented with the open table thing, thought, "No, I've had enough of those emails. I'm going to book. I just want to be able to book. I don't want any more." And they didn't mm. tick it, and then you can continue to send them stuff. They might wonder why you were doing What's that. Going on? Yeah, but I was wondering that there might be some ways around this. So for that, I was just thinking that maybe in this scenario when you took the 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 data from the third party open mm. table whoever uh if somebody's preference had changed from yes receive marketing to no i.e they or, hadn't or ticked no that response, box, yeah, yeah. no response that you could send them some sort of confirmation email that said um just to let you know you know you've unsubscribed 
if this was an accident, click here mm. or something like that. So I was just, I'm just toying with that idea and I was having a chat with our legal team, but I'll, I'll get back to you. On yeah, that we'll, anyway we'll, because, we'll definitely share yeah, an answer. Yeah, yeah. And, but it's just full of complexity because you've got an API going into a website, mm-hmm. which is a third party, which may not even look like you. And oh man, it's just, and, and and I've done it myself where you're just like, well, I'm not ticking that again because I already get stuff and mm-hmm. I'll end up getting two and I don't want two emails and, <laughs> Oh, so anyway, it would be good if you know it'd be really great if we can if we can mm. tidy that up for people. That'd be but a great question that came out. Yeah, you know, it was really quite phenomenal. A, quite an interesting um, scenario. So, um, Josie, um, so one of our good friends, um, has been having a think about the session on okay. the train, All right. oh, wow. and she's been travelling about the country, and she sent another question. So, um, she's actually said. We keep our database very clean, so if Mm -hmm. someone hasn't opened their emails for the last six months, we unsubscribe them. Mm -hmm. Do we then need to send a reconfirmation email, or can we continue doing that on a legitimate interest basis? Um, If she's... This sounds like quite a good process, you know, Mm -hmm. and and obviously they've got... uh, I mean, it depends on the products and the services and the type of business you are. It might be longer than six months or Mm -hmm. it might be, you know, it might be shorter. I thought 13... We've been through this with a couple of clients, you know, and 13 months seemed like one of the best. Okay. Uh, Just because you were... It was actually to do with birthday emails. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, Because then, you you know, on that 13 Because that might encourage them to... That that last chance again. And that was a... And then, but probably after six, you would put them into a customer life cycle. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, and again, this you know. this is why the legislation is quite good in some ways because it doesn't say anybody that hasn't um, interacted with your emails uh, in six months you have to delete. Yeah. Right? It doesn't say that, so it le- it gives you that flexibility, mm-hmm. and you can make that decision. So you know, some people might say thirteen months, some might say twenty four months. In this case, if somebody hasn't uh, in, you know engaged with the email at all in six months, it's up to you. I mean, if you want to choose to just drop them off your database or archive them or yep. put them into a no responder file and then like delete them 12 months later or whatever that's entirely up to you if that person then opts in again at a later stage you know through some other interaction or whatever that's fine you know they're now back on the list and they're you know they're in the, that life cycle yep. again yeah no i think that was a good a good question mm. um i'm noticing the time because <laughs> we've been going on for quite oh, a bit okay. and also um, how hot it is in here it's like a real it is. The, the new studio <laughs> is a sweat box it's, um, it's very scandy yeah, it's quite quite warm <laughs> it's getting there um, so you know the last couple of things that were you know kind of on my mind mm-hmm. was okay you know sort of almost the top tips now you know sort of seeing you know and what's next what do you do you've listened to this podcast you're having a look around and then where do you start? You know, what's the five things you should do immediately yeah. or something like that would be really helpful, I think. Okay. Well, the one, th- I mean, if it isn't already um, some sort of priority in your business, you need to make it a priority, mm-hmm. right? So everybody needs to be aware of GDPR. There needs to be somebody that's sort of responsible for just making sure that each part of the business, uh, you know, is is getting up to speed. And it's not just about talking to marketing managers or data people or MDs or whatever. Anybody that interacts with data in whatever way, you know, people on the telephone, um, you know, people who are transcribing forms or whatever it might be, so that they're aware of the of the new um, responsibilities that they have. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best way to get started and certainly um what i always recommend is that people sort of have a look at their have a look at their data audit your data right you might think that it's just in one place but i guarantee that when you start talking to other people you'll find that they've got sources of data or they take extracts of data and mm-hmm. hold it somewhere and you need to know about that and you need to be able to sort of um sort of map where it's going if it's going out to third parties for for other services you need to know where that is and once you've got a sort of a plan of where it is it just means that you know you can understand and put in any any controls that you might need to you you need to understand your legal basis for processing data so are you going to continue to communicate or process people's data after may uh, 25th using consent or legitimate interest or a combination of the two Mm -hmm. um but you need to you need to have a think about that. Make sure that your data collection 
statement. So anywhere where you collect people's data, whether it's a, an online form or a paper form or whatever, make sure that they're up to the right standard, that people are being told the right thing. There's a link to a privacy policy there and make sure that that privacy policy is up to date and says says the right information. That's something that you can do right now. It's not that difficult and it means that any data that you're collecting now will be you know will be fine you can just carry on using that um you know f- f- you know for as long as you like one of the things that we talked about was about giving people control all the research that we've done at the dma shows that people like to have control over their data right oh. so preference centers are quite popular uh, and that's basically a play you know you can have a link to a preference center um on the bottom of it, bottom of an email or, or whatever and people can go there and they can choose what they receive and when they receive it. So it might be it might be something quite simple, you know, do you want to hear from us email, post, yep. SMS? Yep. Um, or it might be, do you want to hear about events? Do you want to hear about special offers? Mm. All of these kind of different things. Do you want to hear weekly, monthly, mm. quarterly? And then, you know, you can build it up yourself and then, you know, work with the data that way. But a really important thing, you know, in thinking about the Man U example, was just make your segments clear. Yeah, you know, and because theirs, was, so theirs was very confusing, yeah. wasn't it? And I, th- I, I think it's a straightforward grid. Yeah, you know, type of communications. Yeah. you know, subjects, or, you know, periods of time or whatever. Yeah, something like that would be much easier. It's important to keep a record of everything you do. Mm. So if you if you're going to be starting a new marketing campaign, maybe you want to, you know describe it in a policy you know and then you can just store that in you know in in with your marketing you know you might already do this in some sort of way with uh sort of like briefing documents and that kind of thing yep. and you just extend that and i also think it's a good idea to to train people um in data protection and 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 obviously this includes data security as well a lot of companies do this you know they take on board new starters mm-hmm. they give them a quick overview data protection what they can and can't do with yep. data um in within the company and i think that's a good idea um, particularly now that the the rules have changed and it gives you a chance to bring people up to speed. Mm. And I think one of the interesting things was, um, you know, one of the people in the room was in a very lucky position because they were getting a data protection officer. Oh, that's right. As yeah. part of it, I was like, wow, I'll get you. <laughs> yeah. Whereas everybody else was like, oh my God, a what? Yeah, so <laughs> some, some companies, larger companies, can afford to employ a person whose job it is to, to manage all of this yeah, yeah. and to make sure everything's compliant uh, and they know where everything is. Um, quite a responsible role, if you ask me. <laughs> Definitely, and I think though it's it's very much a stitch in time scenario, which is yeah. probably a good thing, you know, like for the amount of money. Even if you got on a yeah. consultative basis, it'd probably I be mean, a good it, idea. It's a bit like health and safety. I mean, years mm. and years ago, health and safety was like you know an Whatever. afterthought, but now it's something that has to be discussed yeah, at board yeah. level. You have to have those training yeah. sessions, and I think um, data protection will will be seen much like that. Be into there, yeah, brilliant. Well, have you got any final? Final thoughts? <laughs> no, I think I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit thoughted out. Good, good luck, everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, so what- well, actually, there is one thing to say. Um, I know we keep talking about May 25th, um, and a lot of people might be sort of like a bit frightened that May 25th isn't a long way, isn't a long way yeah. away. But th- it's not like it's not like an exam. It's not like you're going to be asked to put your pen down yeah. and get marked or on the May millennium 26th. bug, yeah, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. This is very much an ongoing process, right? So. If it's not all done by May 25th, as mm. long as you're on that journey, you're making the effort, you know, you can be seen to be doing things. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a reason to not do anything. And I don't think it's a reason to suddenly start working Panic. 20 hours a day. You know, just keep the process going. Yeah, no, that's good advice. And what we must do, though, is, you know, maybe in a few months' time, get you back on and then we can <laughs> we can see who's went to jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't. They haven't. So that it would be really good just to see, you know, what progress everyone's made. And you know, at the end of the day, we're we're always talking about being customer centric, and yeah. this is part of this customer centric. An excellent way of doing it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. And like at the start of this week, I knew one percent of this, <laughs> and now you know I feel a lot more comfortable, and I think okay. our clients do as well, and, and hopefully the people listening do too. And just to say, you know, I'd thoroughly, thoroughly recommend getting in touch with you guys, um, you know, for a wee session or a wee chat or, <laughs> you know, anything like that, because, you know, it, it's it's been pretty life changing for a lot of people that sat in that room. OK. Um, yeah. For the better. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, so, yeah, GDPR, hopefully you've been schooled <laughs> a bit and, um, you know, you feel a bit more confident about it and. It's nothing to be too worried about. So thanks so much, John. Thank you. Thank you. 
So there you have it. Hopefully you've learned lots and lots about GDPR. A big, big thanks to John Mitchison, who is the Director of Policy and Compliance at the DMA. Do get in touch with him. Do check it out if you need any advice and any help with GDPR for your business. I can't recommend them enough. Do check out the podcast notes where there'll be lots of links to what John talked about. Thanks to everyone as well who's shared, rated, reviewed and subscribed to the Spectacular Marketing Podcast. We've been charting quite high, uh, top 40 in the marketing chart and top 150 in the UK business chart. So thanks so much for that. Huge thanks also to Gabby, Gaz and Michal, the exec production team for all of their hard work. I'm Mark McCulloch and this was Spectacular. Spectacular.